And good evening, folks. Good evening, and welcome back to Mozart and the Burden of Genius. In our last program, we spent some time talking about Mozart the youth. What were those first 15 or 20 years like? And I think we were all astounded by some of the facts that one comes across when studying Mozart's youth. For example, the extreme precociousness which allowed him to learn how to play piano, or probably harpsichord, which was still somewhat in fashion in the 1750s and 1760s, simply, seemingly by osmosis, just watching his seven-year-old sister taking lessons, and he's able, to some degree, to absorb those sounds and to recognize what musicians probably think of today as intervals and chords and all of the building blocks of music. Mozart was able to demonstrate facility with these concepts at an almost impossibly, inconceivably young age. We talked about his role as a concertizing, traveling wunderkind, somebody who went around Europe, or I should say rather was paraded around Europe by his father, Leopold Mozart. Leopold Mozart was a violinist and a pedagogue who eventually say what we will about him, and certainly there's been a lot of antagonism directed towards Leopold Mozart. He tends to be depicted as a rather grim figure in music history. But at the same time, it must be said that he sacrificed much of his life, much of his industry, to make sure that his son and also his daughter had every opportunity to excel as musicians. We talked about the various feats that Mozart demonstrated, feats of musical, extreme musical acumen, which he demonstrated in his youth, perhaps the most impressive and striking of which was the transcription of Allegri's Miserere, that motet setting that we looked at last week which Mozart supposedly heard in St. Peter's, was, we could say, enchanted by the music, wanted to see the sheet music, was forbidden from doing so, and so went back several hours later and transcribed a complex polyphonic motet from memory. That's a, a concept that, for musicians, will seem like something on the order of hocus pocus. It doesn't seem to make sense. In fact, uh, this past week, I was teaching my Music Theory 4 class. And we do an exercise called dictation. Um, anyone who studied music will remember dictation and probably wince at the thought of it because dictation is a rather unpleasant thing to do. But you have to do it. I don't think anybody really enjoys doing it. And the idea is that the instructor sits at the piano and will play something simple, say, a hymn. Could be a Bach chorale. That's typically the primary literature that we use for advanced dictation. And the pupil's job is to transcribe in real time something like two or perhaps three, or if they're really good, all four parts. And if you're really good at that and you have, you have incredible ears, maybe you'll be able to get something like, oh, I don't know, a measure on one hearing. Um, the thought of transcribing any length of polyphonic music is really a, a heady thought and once again testifies to that very weighted word that we threw around a little bit last week in which we will revisit this week and certainly in the subsequent weeks, and that word was genius. Today we're going to shift our focus to Mozart's life starting around the age of 20, and we're going to cast a very focused spotlight on this disastrous period where Mozart goes to Paris at the end of the 1770s. So he's a fairly young guy when he sets off for Paris. He's just past his 20th birthday, and the objective, of course, was to procure some kind of meaningful employment. We've talked in the past about this seeming paradox with the whole idea of the burden of genius. After all, as we said last week, most of us would love to be a genius, or what other people would call a genius at least, and yet with Mozart, it didn't seem to do him any good. And I think that this disastrous trip in the 1770s provides ample evidence of just how much he seemed to have fallen. His star seems to have waned from his youth. Story goes something like this. Mozart was from a small town in western Austria, a town some of you may have visited. Certainly nowadays, if you do visit this town, you will no doubt visit the Mozart uh, Geburthaus. This is the, the house where Mozart grew up. And this, the town is Salzburg. Salzburg back then was a, a rather dull place, or at least we get that impression reading Mozart's letter. He seems to complain ad infinitum to his father somewhat, but mostly to friends and certainly to his cousin uh, 
uh, with whom he exchanged some very body letters, which we'll get to uh, in a subsequent program. He seems to complain endlessly about Salzburg. And I think probably what, mi what made him miserable there were a combination of factors. Number one, this is where his father was. And it became clear when Mozart reached, oh, say, the age of 18, that his father was still attempting to control his life, or at least dictate the various branching paths that Mozart should take. And of course, no kid appreciates that. I think that much is true today, and it was certainly true 250 years ago. Moreover, musically speaking, Salzburg lacked one thing, one thing we're not going to talk about today, but which we'll be pretty much exclusively talking about next week, and that was opera. Mozart was keen on composing opera. His first opera probably dates from around his 12th birthday, his first complete opera. And by the time he had reached the age of 14, he had already written what might be thought of as a minor blockbuster, Mitridate Re de Ponto, 1770. And here he is, now an adult, and stuck in Salzburg and making a pretty measly salary of 150 florins, which is not a lot of money back then. And so Mozart decides that it's time to get out of Salzburg and to pursue fortunes elsewhere in Europe. And it stands to reason that the ultimate wunderkind, the ultimate child genius, this anomaly who is capable of doing seemingly impossible things at such a young age, would be the most desirable prospect for hire in any musical court or institution. Seems to us that way, at least. Of course, that was not the reality. His first stop on the way was in a German city called Mannheim. Mannheim was famous in this period for having a very, say, well-disciplined orchestra. This was the age that orchestras started to emerge as ornaments to a particular city or bishopric or whatever it was. And at Mannheim, he was up for the gig of assistant director of the orchestra, which would have been a great gig for him. It would have allowed him to conduct on certain occasions and certainly would have allowed him to compose music, which he could sort of have this great, well-disciplined, finely tuned group of musicians as the proverbial guinea pigs who he knew would be capable of playing dazzling virtuoso material. So Mannheim seems like a pretty good place to start. Two terrible things happened to Mozart in Mannheim. Number one, he fell in love. Big mistake. He fell in love with a singer. Even bigger mistake. I'm just kidding. I'm, I love singers. Mozart fell in love with a woman named Aloysia Weber. Aloysia Weber was an up-and-coming opera star. In fact, she would go on to have quite a career as an opera singer, and eventually Mozart would write certain roles for her. In fact, uh, next week we'll talk about Don Giovanni, 1787, and for those of you who know that opera, the character of Donna Anna, Mozart wrote that music with his sister-in-law in mind. Now you're saying, wait a second, didn't you just say that he was in love with her, but you just said that she was his sister-in-law by 1787. So that means that, yes, Mozart fell in love desperately in love. If we read the letters, we really get a sense of just how profound this affection was. And when he was rejected, he wound up marrying her sister, which to a contemporary audience might seem a little, how do the kids say, creepy? Yeah? I think that's a good word. That's a little strange, isn't it? Um, not so strange back then. The other bad thing that happened to Mozart in Mannheim is that he sort of blew his shot with the Mannheim Orchestra. Remember that very plum assistant conductor gig that he was up for? Well, we don't know exactly what happened, and this story may be apocryphal, but it is believable based on what we know of Mozart's personality. The story goes like this. The day where he arrives in Mannheim, he goes to hear the Mannheim Orchestra. And he's listening to them play, and they're playing an original piece by the conductor of that orchestra, a guy by the name of Johann Vogel. Vogel means bird in, uh, in German. And afterwards, Mr. Vogel is talking to Mozart, and he says, well, what did you think of the symphony? <laughs> now, this seems like a really, what do we call this one? A slow pitch softball question, right? You can't strike out on this one. But of course, Mozart, being Mozart, and again, we can speculate as to why his personality was like this. 
But the story goes that Mozart took this opportunity to eviscerate this particular symphony, to point out all of its many flaws, and to illuminate exactly how it might have been made better, augmented, you see, with more interesting thematic development and perhaps more interesting harmonic underpinnings to the themes. But of course, that did not do anything to enhance his prospects as the new hire for this position. And so Mannheim turned out to be a total bust for Mozart. He leaves Mannheim heartbroken. Well, at this point, not heartbroken. At this point, he's, uh, you might say, in a kind of state of puppy love. Uh, he hadn't been rejected yet. It would be on the return trip that he would be greeted with an icy, cold uh, disposition from this woman with whom he had formerly been very affectionate. So he's still jobless, and of course, he's still single. And he makes his way through several other towns until he finally arrives in France. Now, Mozart had been warmly embraced as a child in France on several tours. In fact, perhaps the most famous one was when he was no older than six or seven years old. And the story goes that Marie Antoinette herself was so charmed by his playing that she lavished all sorts of praise on him. And this was, of course, praise from the highest uh, of most esteemed royal patrons. It could not be a more different reception in 1778 when Mozart arrives in France. It was a rather dreary winter, that particular winter, and they did not have a lot of money. And when I say they, Mozart was not alone. Leopold, you see, would not grant permission for his son to go off gallivanting around Europe, around Germany and France for exactly the reasons that we saw in Mannheim. Leopold felt that Mozart lacked discipline, and I think we can agree. He may have been onto something in that respect. Leopold was especially horrified when Mozart sent back letters indicating that he had fallen in love. For Leopold, this was the worst thing that could be possible because it would distract Mozart from the primary objective of this trip, which is to get a job, to find really meaningful employment. So there he is in Paris, and disaster after disaster strikes perhaps the most devastating of which took place in July of 1778, and that was the death of his travel companion, and that travel companion was his mother. Mozart was 22 at the time. His mother was, I believe, 57. So she was on the road with him, sent as a kind of chaperone and perhaps something on the order of a moral compass, and she arrives in Paris, and by that summer she had taken ill and to this day, nobody knows exactly what killed her. There are different theories, one of which is dysentery. From the symptoms that Mozart describes, uh, we get the impression that it is something like dysentery, if it's not that exactly. So there are people, for example, like Maynard Solomon. If you read Solomon's biography, he'll go in and have all sorts of speculations based on the evidence. Um, what's important, of course, is that Mozart's mother died, and he was helpless to stop it, powerless and Furthermore, alone and essentially just a kid, 22 years old, with no money to hire medical uh, personnel to come over and see to his mother's health, uh, he essentially watched her die over a period of about two weeks. And he doesn't really write much about it. In fact, curiously, he waits about two weeks to write to his father to tell him. And that, I think, testifies to the sense of dread he must have had at sharing this news. And sure enough, when Leopold writes back, he includes one of the most distasteful, contemptible lines that we attribute to Leopold, which was something like, and I, I think this is it verbatim, actually, he said, had I been there, your mother would still be alive. For these reasons and others, you can see why Leopold Mozart gets a bad rap. Whatever good he did, I think it's fair to say that he also did a lot of bad and probably psychologically inflicted no small amount of trauma on Wolfgang Amadeus. Out of this period, we get a couple of very interesting pieces. We're going to listen to three pieces today from the Paris period. I think Paris is a really interesting period because it marks, if not a maturation exactly, it, marched, it marks a cusp in Mozart's development. You see, we have this early period, which goes up right about until the age of 20. Then we have this period, which includes Paris and some works composed in Salzburg. And then by the time we get to next week, 
which is the 1780s when Mozart hits the age of, say, 24, 25, he's now arrived in the last phase of his life, which is the Vienna phase. And some of you are doing the math and saying, wait a second, he was 25. How long was that last phase? And the answer is about 10 years. So Mozart would be dead just a month shy of his 36th birthday. I want to start with a piece which is written for solo piano. And it falls into the genre of, you guessed it, a piano sonata. The word sonata comes from an Italian word simply meaning something that sounds. And the implication is, sounds pleasant. I think it's very important to note that the sonata is really a classical creation. It's a product of the Enlightenment era. If you use the word sonata, we're really talking about the year 1750 and beyond. In Bach's day, Bach would not have used the word sonata, at least not in the way we think of it. Sonata is something very specific, and Mozart happened to write 19 of them. So we get a pretty good template, let's say, uh, a kind of a Bible of how to write a sonata. If you're ever looking to study sonatas, you can do a lot worse than studying Mozart's 19 piano sonatas. Of those 19, vast majority, about 90%, all but two, are in major keys. And we talked a little bit last week about major keys versus minor keys. I want to talk a little bit more about that today. It may seem a little arcane, but I think it is important. The whole concept of what key are we in might seem a little abstract to someone who hasn't studied this sort of thing. But perhaps I can give you some examples which will illuminate the significance of keys and why they're important. Sometimes you'll hear musicians use phrases like, this is the sonata in C major, right? This is a symphony in D minor. And we can sort of write it off, say, what's the big deal, right? D minor, E minor, F minor, what's, what's the difference? Well, 300 years ago, there were big differences. There were entire treatises dedicated to discussing the significance of keys. For Bach, certain keys had certain meanings. If you were in the key of C minor, Bach uses that very often to suggest the concept of sleep as a metaphor for death. And there are endless examples of that. For example, Cantata 82, Ich habe genug, is C minor. Uh, Cantata 56, Ich will den, den Kreuzstab gerne tragen, I will gladly carry the cross. That's also C minor. Um, in the St. John Passion, the last choral movement, where the chorus sings, Ruth wohl, rest, you holy bones, C minor. That key meant something to Bach. If we talk about other keys, say the key of E major, for Bach that was a very bright key, four sharps. And in general, Bach uses it for, and I'll use a strange word here, for articulating eschatological ideas. That is to say, ideas which anticipate heaven and the next world in a good way. They're positive. The general rule of thumb for Bach is that if you're in a flat minor key, it's bad. It's something to do with suffering or sin or going to hell. For example, in the St. Matthew Passion, when Jesus is on the cross, we get some of the seven expressions from the cross. And perhaps the most striking is when Jesus sings, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic, but is translated for us. And it's translated as, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For Bach, this is the ultimate nadir of the human condition. Because, of course, according to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is divine, but he is also human. And therefore, in that moment of frailty and human weakness, he asks God, why have you forsaken me? For Bach, that's E flat minor. Six flats. And if a musician were to read it, you would look at the page, and it would look funny. There would be all these marks, C flat. There's even an F flat in that, in that passage. Very unusual. But for Bach, it meant something. Now, is that something that we, listeners, of all different backgrounds are going to listen to and say, oh, golly, yeah, that makes sense. I hear it. It's in a deep, flat key. No, we wouldn't. Not unless you had exceptionally good ears and were attuned to that sort of thing. When we get to Mozart, I think the meaning of keys becomes diluted a little bit for Mozart. They become dictated by certain practical considerations. For Mozart, one interesting thing is that throughout the entire catalog, there isn't a single closed movement which is written with more than three sharps or flats. He never goes beyond A major or E flat major, and he never goes beyond C minor or F sharp minor. He never goes beyond those. 
And that confounds some musicians, but there are reasons for that. Most of Mozart's music, of course, is in a major key. And as far as his piano sonatas go, they really run the gamut, but they tend to have a rather cheerful sound. Um, some of you may know the sonata in A major, which is a theme and variation, starts with this really, I think, charming and tranquil theme. We get this feeling listening to this music, there's something comforting about it, isn't there? And there are many biographers, Hildesheimer, for example, Maynard Solomon, who I've mentioned, who suggest that Mozart somehow wanted people to be happy when they listened to his music, which is plausible, right? I think most artists, maybe not so much today, uh, certainly not at the beginning of the 20th century. I'm looking at you, Igor Stravinsky. <laughs> but I think most artists want their music to be enjoyed on some level. Now, I'm not suggesting that an artist necessarily is pandering all the time. Certainly, Beethoven is a great example of somebody who's really doing different things and breaking a lot of rules. But there are some stories about Mozart which reinforce this idea. One story that Solomon relates. When Mozart was a kid, about seven years old, eight years old, he's home in Salzburg. And his father is the first violinist, essentially. He's the, the Kapellmeister of the, of the orchestra. So Mozart's hanging out with the orchestra all day. And he's going around to everyone in the orchestra, and he says, do you love me? Yes or no? <laughs> and of course, who could say no? Because he's such a charming little kid. He's well-spoken. He's a fantastic musician. One trumpeter, whose name is lost to history. I mean, I'm sure we could look it up if we really wanted to. But one trumpeter said to Mozart, no, I don't love you. And the story is that eight-year-old Mozart began weeping inconsolably. Now, that suggests something. And it makes sense if we consider his biography. If you're this boy who's hearing nothing but good things about you all the time, you're getting showered with praise and accolades, being lauded for everything you do, that you become conditioned to that, right? And I think perhaps that explains why so much of his music is in major key. Again, the idea is when you have music, whether it's slow, like I just played, or faster, um, something like this. Um, oh, I don't know. 
so fast I knocked the microphone off. <laughs> this kind of music stands in stark contrast to, say, the music of Bach. Bach's music, it's inconceivable that Bach would do something like this. And let's slow it down. It's just scales. It's just up and down C major, alternating two chords. What we call tonic and dominant. It would be for someone like Bach, I think, almost nauseatingly simple. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Remember, when we move into the Enlightenment period, into the late 18th century, there's a desire for simplicity. There's a desire to move away from the complexity, from all of the polyphonic content which we get in late Baroque music, especially in Bach. The sonata we're going to look at right now is a sonata in A minor. So automatically it's interesting because it's in a minor key. It's very hard for musicologists, and they tend to be very uh, circumspect about trying to find any kind of compositional intent in a particular work, to say, for example, that Mozart wrote this sonata because he was depressed because his mother died. We don't know that. It might make all the sense in the world that he would use this opportunity right after his mother's death, a few months later, to write this son sonata in A minor, one of the only ones in a minor key. But we can't say that. We can only say that it's possible. It's conceivable that, he, that that's the reason. It's an interesting sonata. It includes a tremendous amount of dissonance. And I think for me and for many other listeners, it seems to anticipate the sound that Beethoven would channel in works like the Pathetique Sonata and the Moonlight Sonata, the Appassionata, this kind of throwing caution to the wind and embracing the dissonance. Mozart, for example, starts the sonata. It's in A minor, and he starts it like this. Just breaking down those opening bars, let's listen to it. First of all, he could have done this. Instead, he does this. Do you hear that, what we call a grace note? You know, uh, in a later generation, they call this note a, a uh, flat five, you know, uh, in the jazz tones. Right? That'd be a totally different idiom completely, but this kind of having that dissonant grace note, the tritone against the tonic, unusual. Then, having this chord seems to have an especially piquant character to it, a bite, you might say. And it's something that we find very little of, I would say, in his other keyboard works. His other sonatas, again, going back to that theme in variations, we get six variations on that theme. And they run the gamut. Uh, you know, it's, the first one is fast with all these chromatic notes. The, uh, even when we listen to that, I think it sounds more playful than anything else, right? It has this kind of uh, jolly mischievous character to it. And when we get to the fourth variation, Again, a playful character with the hands crossing especially, taking the tune and sort of doubling up in the left hand. Above the right hand, we would listen to that, and I think many people would find it serene, pleasant, playful. The A minor sonata is a different story. And especially when we get to the development section, you'll hear this sort of rumbling in the bass. And he's doing. And you'll hear that over and over again in different keys. And it'll be. And it seems, again, to anticipate Beethoven was very fond of doing this sort of rumbling bass, where this idea of just having a sustained, angry, churning, grumbling sound in the bass. And in fact, the Germans call that the, uh, sometimes it's known as a, what translates to a murky bass line. So here's the sonata in A minor. We won't listen to the whole thing, but um, we will listen to a couple of sections in it. <laughs> 
And this is Daniel Barenboim playing here. Again, a sonata written in the aftermath of the death of Mozart's mother. And I'll pause it there. There's a repeat of the development section, which, of course, is going to be unique to every performance. We can hear the dissonance there, right? This doesn't have that jolly, mischievous character. This sounds like something different. And again, there's a couple of Mozart works that were written about by later generations. This is one of them. The Piano Concerto Number no. 20 in D minor K488 is another one such work that really influenced the Romantics. We think of the Romantic generation, the ones who came after Beethoven, for example, Schubert, Mendelssohn, Brahms, Chopin, Liszt. Those composers, they were looking for expressivity. And I think they didn't find it in every Mozart composition, but they did write about pieces like this one. And I think it constitutes a unique work in his piano repertoire, so much of which is ensconced so firmly in the soundscape of the major key. And of course, this is not, and therefore has a very different sound. And it's a sound that later generations, for example, the generations who prized works like the Pathetique Sonata by Beethoven, the Moonlight Sonata, the Appassionata Sonata, what do all those sonatas have in common? They're all in minor keys. And so there's something perhaps about the minor key we said last week that Mozart had seemed to have an aversion to it, but there seems to be something appealing on a very personal, poignant level that many listeners respond to. Certainly that was the case in the early 19th century. That does it for minor keys today. And uh, we'll have very little in the way of minor key music next week, with the exception of the Queen of the Nights aria, Die Hölle Rache kocht in meinem Herzen. So the next couple of works we're going to study are going to be in major keys. Let's return to the, yes, question. No, uh, that's a great question. Mozart's sister did not learn from Mozart. Well, I should say not from Wolfgang Mozart. She learned from Leopold Mozart, their father. So she was five years older than, than her brother. And uh, apparently, if you read the literature from that period, she was every bit the virtuoso that he was. In fact, on many of these tours where they were playing for the wealthy elite of Europe, his sister, whose nickname was Nanerl, and whose name was Maria Anna, not to be confused with the mother, whose name was Anna Maria. <laughs> Go figure. And then there's a cousin named Maria Anna Tekla. So um, the answer is that they were both brilliant musicians. And Mozart's sister, being the elder of the two, was probably the first person, the first of the Mozart children, to really attain this title of wunderkind or child prodigy. Uh, had there never been a Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and had she been born in a later century, it's, well, nothing certain. But it seems very likely that Mozart's sister would have been every bit the musician that we think of Mozart having become. No. As far as composition goes, uh, Maria Anna engaged in almost nothing as far as writing music. Uh, that was just not appropriate or considered to be appropriate for a young girl in that period. She was, as a child, she was encouraged to play, but once she hit the age of 15, uh, she was encouraged to pursue more serious responsibilities, marrying and children, namely. So she was a casualty of the time that she lived in. Nonetheless, um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that she was a brilliant musician and somebody who was really every bit her brother's sister, if that makes sense. Compounding the disaster of his mother's death in the late 1770s, Mozart ran into ongoing fiscal woes. You might say that money burned a hole in the man's pocket. That would certainly be the case when he later achieved some success in Vienna. But it was especially terrible for him in Paris. He complained bitterly about living in an unheated apartment with no fireplace and no means to heat a fireplace. Now, I think we all enjoy the luxury of being in a room where it's 28 degrees outside. And it's certainly not 28 degrees inside or anything close to that. Imagine being in a room where in the winter it's consistently hovering, say, around the 45 degree mark. It's a life of privation that we have trouble imagining today, although if I ever want to get a taste of that, I can go visit my parents' house in the winter. My, my dad has a very simple philosophy when it comes to keeping warm in the winter. Put on more layers. Put on a jacket. 
makes sense. Compounding these problems was the fact that Mozart was a pretty wretched businessman. This is something that would plague him later in his, in his later years, when he was in his late 20s and early 30s. He was just not very good at doing business. And in his defense, he was at the mercy of a system which was crumbling, of course, in Paris. We're doing the math. 1778 is about a decade off from the French Revolution. And yet, probably one of the most infamous examples of this is the commission and composition of the concerto for flute and harp in C major. Flute and harp is a weird combination to write a concerto for. And certainly, it invites investigation as to why Mozart would write a work like this. And what we find is that he wrote it for a particular duke, a member of the aristocracy and a very important aristocratic figure. To earn some money, Mozart had begun teaching lessons. He didn't like teaching lessons, go figure. He thought it distracted him from composition, and he complained in letters about the ineptitude of various students. This particular student, he praised her ability to play the harp, but he described her as something on the order of a dolt when it came to music theory and composition. She was hopeless, you see. She couldn't learn even the most basic rudiments of how to write music, how to compose counterpoint. She was beyond salvation as far as that went. Nonetheless, she was a talented harp player, and her father was a talented flautist. And the story goes that this particular individual commissioned Mozart the promise of a fat paycheck of, I think, 12 Louis d'Or to write this concerto that would feature his daughter and himself as the obligato soloists. Mozart obliged and was never paid. It's a sad story because it underscores Mozart's, again, his, his own ineptitude as far as representing himself and being his own advocate and agent. But of course, posterity is grateful for this particular episode because Mozart has sort of bequeathed unto us this particularly unique concerto for flute and harp. A word about concertos and the role of the concerto in the Enlightenment period in the late 18th century. The concerto dates to the late 17th century, and we tend to associate it with Baroque composers, people like Arcangelo Corelli and Georg Philipp Telemann and Antonio Vivaldi and, of course, Handel and Bach. By the time of the Enlightenment, the concerto had become something totally different. It had evolved into a vehicle for showcasing the role of the soloist. And this is essentially what we get here. Remember last week we talked about cadenzas? We also talked about credenzas. We're not going to talk about credenzas anymore. We're just going to talk about cadenzas. Mozart did not write one for this piece. So if you're playing this piece now, you've got to come up with your own or use something that someone ha else has written. Someone like, uh, for example, Andre Previn has written a cadenza for this piece. So this is the concerto for flute and harp. It has a totally unique sound because of the timbre of those two instruments. It is virtuosic in the extreme, meaning it really pushes the boundaries of what musicians in that period were capable of playing. And we'll pause there. A few notes about this. Number one, we're all enjoying this very intimate atmosphere. It's very it's like being in a movie theater, right? Number one, notice the size of the orchestra. It's rather small, isn't it? Certainly by modern standards, we would think of this as something between an orchestra and a chamber ensemble. The evidence suggests that back in the late 18th century, what we think of as orchestral music was probably performed with no more than 20 people, sometimes 25 people, performing in, in an orchestra. Here, we see Mozart's deafness with respect to instrumentation and orchestration. When the soloists are playing because of the very delicate timbre of the solo instruments, he's very careful to dial back the rest of the orchestra. So for example, you'll notice that when they're playing, he often has the violins and violas plucking in a technique we call pizzicato, the idea being so that they're not overpowering the sound of the soloist. Now, what was the role of the harp? That's a good question, isn't it? What the heck is the role of the harp in the late 18th century? After all, there isn't a lot of literature music literature, that is say, repertoire for harp. Solo is certainly not. Well, the thought is that Mozart and his contemporaries thought of the harp as a kind of plucked piano, 
And if you've ever watched somebody playing contemporary music, especially, sort of what they'll sometimes do is they'll reach up, they'll open the piano, reach inside, and start plucking strings. A harp is, if you think about it, not so dissimilar from that. It really does resemble the inside of the piano in that you have various strings of different sizes, lengths, thicknesses, and they correspond to different pitches. And so it's interesting to think how Mozart would have composed this, not being a harp player himself. How would he have known if this works? And the answer that uh, his biographers point to is that Mozart probably thought of this as a plucked piano part, um, which adds an interesting twist. What that means is that what we're seeing here probably, and most performances, are probably anachronistic to some degree because the harps of the late 1700s do not resemble the modern harps that are used today. In our last portion of class, I think we should turn our attention to the post-Paris period. Always use alliteration. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me, always apply alliteration. Mozart has to leave Paris essentially with his tail between his legs. We can't imagine the trip being more disastrous. Everything he set out to do, he failed in doing. He didn't make any money. In fact, he burnt whatever money he took with him, whatever capital was saved up for the trip. He didn't get a job. The Parisians were curiously indifferent to him. And Mozart complained bitterly about the indifference and this nonchalant attitude that both lay listeners and prospective employers showed towards him. Again, we used that phrase earlier. We said that his star had waned considerably. Remember, when he had last been in Paris, he had been the toast of the town. Now he's living in an unheated flat, and he's watching his mother die while he fails to be paid for works which he is laboring over. He's teaching a lot of lessons just to pay the bills. And so he decides it's time to pack it up and go home. You can imagine the dread he must have experienced at the prospect of facing down, remember good old Leopold, right? On the way back, he stops at the Weber house. Remember the Weber family. Mozart had fallen in love with Aloysia. And there seems to be some evidence that she reciprocated that affection to some degree, at least, or at least she admired him greatly as a musician. When he returns on his way back to Salzburg, he stops in Mannheim, and he is devastated by what a later generation would call the cold shoulder that Aloysia Weber shows him. She acts, as Mozart relates in a letter, like she doesn't even know who he is. We can imagine how this impacted his already failing confidence and how this strengthened his resolve to make a big change in his life, and he does. He toils for a few more years in Salzburg. And he writes some great music while there. His official job, by the way, is as court organist. And he's not making much money, but it's more than he was before he left for Paris. As it happened in the early 1780s, right between 1780 and 81, there's a new emperor in town. Well, he's going to be a new emperor because it's the coronation of Emperor Joseph II, played so memorably by Jeffrey Jones in the movie Amadeus. For those of you who remember Jeffrey Jones, in the movie. He's got a recurring line, no matter what seems to happen in the drama, he has the same line in every scene. He says, well, there it is. <laughs> what do we know about Emperor Joseph II? We know he was a guy who really sincerely loved music. But as Mozart pointed out, he wasn't very good at it. Nonetheless, he admired Mozart, and we'll get to that part in the story in a moment. Mozart had the opportunity to visit the capital of Austria. He has the visit to the imperial capital. He goes to Vienna in seven, late 1780 to attend the coronation of the new emperor. And he's traveling in the household retinue of the Archbishop of Salzburg, a really, I think, unlikable character by the name of Hieronymus Colloredo. Arrogant, cavalier, dismissive, contemptuous. These are adjectives that have been used to describe Mozart's employer in Salzburg, the Archbishop. When he was in Vienna, Mozart was shocked at certain realities, one of which he related in a letter to his father, and I think it's very significant. He talks about how, at a certain feast, he had been seated next to the grooms, the grooms and the stable boys. In other words, the guys who muck out the manure, the guys who you know, take the lint off the emperor's clothes, he's sitting next to them. 
And he can't really rationalize why that is the case. It testifies to the rank and station of composers. They were just thought of as musicians. Now, that would change within 20 years, mostly thanks to Beethoven. That's a story for another day. Nonetheless, Mozart, desperate to leave the employment and the service of the archbishop, decides, well, you can't quit. No such thing as turning in your two weeks notice in the late 18th century when you work for the archbishop. So how do you, well, do the equivalent of quitting? The answer is you get yourself fired. Now, this is a time-honored tradition. Bach, of course, got himself fired from Weimar in 1717. He just stopped composing and stopped performing his duties, so they threw him in detention, something like a jail cell. No uh, piano or, or uh, harpsichord there, but he did have manuscript paper. So while Bach was in jail in 1717, he wrote the well-tempered clavier. Not bad, not bad. For Mozart, he gets himself dismissed from the, from the archbishop's service, literally with a kick to a certain anatomical part of the body which uh, is documented. Mozart himself writes about it. And so begins this most enchanting chapter of Mozart's life, the life of the freelance musician. Now, I think it might be worthwhile, if we have some time, spend the last few minutes watching a clip from the movie Amadeus, where Mozart arrives in Vienna. This will set the stage for next week's discussion, which will primarily be about opera. So here's Jeffrey Jones as Emperor Joseph, and he finds out Mozart is a freelancer, and he says he'd like to meet him. It's a very thought-provoking scene, and obviously it's extremely well acted. We see here in this scene why F. Murray Abraham won the Academy Award for Best Actor in 1984. It's, it, you can't teach that, what he's doing in this scene, the way he's portraying Antonio Salieri. Now, did this scene take place in real life? No. Did something like this happen? Probably. At some point, it's very likely that Mozart made this kind of impression on people, that he was supremely talented, but not at all deferential towards sort of those who had been ensconced in the establishment of Vienna's music scene. Of course, for about a century and a half, it was believed that Mozart and Salieri were an intertwined in some sort of rivalry which resulted in Salieri sort of planning and orchestrating Mozart's death. As we'll talk about in the last program uh, on Valentine's Day, that was not the case. Were they enemies on some level? I think to use uh, a word from a later generation, they were probably closer to frenemies. Um, that is to say, on the surface, I'm sure they observed every decency, but behind closed doors, I would wager that neither had a good thing to say about the other. We'll leave this discussion of Mozart. There are a lot of interesting things to unpack in this scene. Uh, I think the discussion about opera, which of course forms the backdrop of the scene, is something which we'll focus on next week when we talk about Mozart and his dominance as an operatic composer. Opera, of course, was a genre that had been around since the early Baroque period, so about 170 years by the time Mozart starts writing operas. And yet, uh, for many composers, he's the first composer of opera that they're interested in and willing to go pay tickets to go see an opera by Mozart, whereas you might not pay m money to go see uh, an opera by someone like Monteverdi or Cavalli or these older 17th century guys. So next week, we'll address the question, what was it about Mozart that made him such a successful composer at opera? And what was it about his personality that continued to impede and preclude him from reaching that holy grail of attaining lasting, meaningful employment in a high status position. It's been a wonderful audience, and I look forward to seeing everybody next week when we resume the lecture series on Mozart and the Bergen Theater. <laughs> now, we do have some time for Q&A. I understand that we are past eight, so if anybody has to leave, I look forward to seeing you next week. Sir. Great question. Why is there no percussion in period orchestras, that is to say, orchestras from this era? Not only is there no percussion, there are a lot of instruments missing. Do you know it's not until Mozart's 31st symphony, symphony number 31 in D major, the Paris symphony, that we have clarinets in a symphony, in a Mozart symphony at least. It's not until Beethoven's fifth symphony that we have trombones in an orchestra. So 
if you look at the really early symphonies, works by people like Stamitz and Wagenseil and San Martini, by the way, let me suggest this, this music has a certain novelty to it, but it's not the most interesting music. Those early symphonies are written for string orchestras with no winds whatsoever. By the 1760s, they're adding flutes and perhaps oboes. But uh, the orchestra was still in a developmental stage, and it would take some time to add those extra instruments, percussion, brass especially. Yes, as youths, um, nothing, and by the time Mozart was an adult, his sister had gotten married and was living far away, I think about a six-hour carriage right away. So he saw her very infrequently after she got married, which would have been around his 15th birthday. So he saw her very infrequently. As children, they performed duets regularly, and they were a phenomenon. They were a sight to, to behold, uh, the two Mozart kids doing what they did. Probably four hands would be more likely, so two people sharing a piano. Um, but it's not inconceivable that they would have done two pianos. Mozart wrote a piano concerto number 10, which is written for two pianos. So it says that and the flute and harp concerto are his only double concertos, not counting the Sinfonia concert time. Yeah, ma'am. He did. He had two children who survived. Interesting thing about both of his children. Uh, one of them went on to be a, uh, like a politician or something like that. Franz Xavier Mozart went on to become, uh, not a politician exactly, but he worked for, he was a government bureau bureaucrat. He died in 1858 and he was childless. And Mozart's other son, uh, who was born uh, two years before Mozart died, so he never really received instruction from his father, um, but went on, like his, the other Mozart child, they were both very talented musically, both went on to have careers outside of music. Both died childless. I think that last detail is the most interesting to historians because it essentially means that the Mozart line died sometime in the middle of the 19th century. And that, uh, of course, is a, a frustrating sort of stymieing fact for uh, historians to deal with when exploring the lineage of Mozart in both directions. His sister did have children. Uh, not one of whom went on to do anything noteworthy in music, or at least nothing that would get them so much as a footnote in a music history textbook. You'd have to read something you know, on the graduate level about music from that period, and specifically about Mozart's family, to find anything about those children. I haven't read anything in, in any conventional literature about it. All right, next week we'll be looking at two operas, Don Giovanni, is, of course, in Italian, and then we'll turn our attention to Die Zauberflöte, the Magic Flute, 1791, premiered three months before Mozart's death. So I look forward to seeing everybody in just one week. Thanks again, folks. Thanks again.